lecz istniejszy od ci, szanowni czleny to przychylniki NTSZ w Kanadzie, drogi studenty, dostojni gości. Moje imię jest Lubożu, jak głowa monrealskiego osiedlu NTSZ. Szczerze witam was na pierwszym wystupie tego ukraińskiego wkładu w cywilizację. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lubazuk, and as head of the Montreal chapter of the Shevchenko Scientific Society of Canada, I welcome you very warmly to the first presentation in our cycle of lectures on Ukrainian contributions to civilization. And now I shall ask Professor Radoslav Zhuk to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Ostap Havadeshka. Ja poproszę teper Profesora Zhuka przedstawiti naszego dostojnego dokumentacza Profesora Ostapa Havadeshka. Good afternoon. Szanowni Panie i Panowie. Professor Ostap Havaleska graduated from McGill University in Montreal with a B engineering cum laude and Master of Engineering in Aerodynamics degrees. More recently, he was awarded the honor the Doctor of Science degree from the renowned Institute of Metal Physics of the Ukraine National Academy of Science. After graduation from McGill, he worked three years exploring for petroleum in the most remote areas of most Latin American countries. He has also consulted in various Asian and South American countries with Canada's HIDA, IDRB, and the Asian Development Bank. He also researched and taught aerodynamics at the University of British Columbia and hydraulics and civil engineering at McGill University. In 1970, he accepted the position as assistant professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Manitoba. There he established a highly successful program in industrial engineering. After leaving the field of fluid mechanics, Professor Havaleska developed devoted his research, teaching, and consulting to the field of management. Publishing nearly 100 papers, articles, and reports, he and his research team received the top research award for their work on the unique hazard program for prediction of chemical weapons clouds. For his extensive work with local industries and indigenous nations, he received the University of Manitoba's Outreach Award, as well as the Association of Professional Engineers of Manitoba Merit Award. Upon his retirement in 1997, he was honored with the title Emeritus Professor of the University of Manitoba. In 1994, he was appointed by the government of Canada to establish and head the Science and Technology Center of Ukraine. The STCU, as it was called, was established by Canada, the USA, and later the EU to redirect Ukrainian weapons of mass destruction scientists to peaceful activities. And has successfully supported research projects of more than 20,000 Ukrainian scientists. In Canada, he was recognized with two Queen Elizabeth II medals, plus St. George's Medal, St. Volodymyr Medal of the World Ukrainian Congress, Gurava Award of the Manitoba branch of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, and the highest award, the Order of Canada. He has been honored by Ukraine with the Yangel and Kordachuk medals and by being named as its first honorary consul for the province of Manitoba. Ustav Havaleska rodился в Bukaresti, pizniejsze перебував з батьками в Німеччині і Франції, 
від 1952 року у Канаді. Його дипломи – це бакалаврал і, і магістерка і інженерії в університету Мегіл. Почесний докторат Інституту фізики металів Києва. Праця Південна Америка. Консультор Європа, Південна Америка, Східно-Південна Азія. Від 1970 року професор університету Манітоби Вініпер. 1994-1998 він був засновником та виконуючим директором Українського науково-технічного центру в Києві. Бувший президент Канадсько-Української фундації та ряду громадських організацій, особливо просту. Нагороди і признання. Університетський, найкращий науковий механічної інженерії, заслужений професор. Державний, почесний консул України в Манітобі та медалі Кондрачука і Янгела. Канаді, Орден Канади, дві медалі королеві Єросовети II, Бурава, Конгресу українців Канади, Світовий Конгрес українців, нагорода святого Володимира. Пане професоре, будь ласка, почніть вашу доповідь. Шановні пане і панове, Вітаю всіх вас тут на цій доповіді. Як техніка наша е, спрацює, то буде все в порядку, як ні, то вибачайте. В кожному випадку я дякую керівникам НТС Монтреальському осередкові наукового товариства Шевченко в Канаді, що мені дали можливість висловити кілька слів на тему, яка мене вже довгі роки мучить близько до серця. Всі ми Кожен з нас хоче знати, що ми живемо в країні або походимо з країни, якою можна гордитися. Тому не пошкодить нам знати про важливі та суттєві досягнення України в різноманітних сферах, включно з тислотехнічною сферою, котру моя доповідь якраз буде наголошувати. Тепер є можливість, що серед наших Слухачів знаходяться декотрі мої товариші, декотрі науковці або співпрацівники з України, з Америки, з Стейт-департаменту, з якими я мав честь плідно працювати на добро України. Я вас всіх щиро вітаю. I would really would like to thank the Montreal chapter of the Shevchenko Society of Canada that it offered me the opportunity to talk on a subject which has been close to my heart for many years now. Each one of us wants to be proud of the country that we call ours or the country from which we originate. It would be appropriate then to know about that country's contributions, in this case, Ukraine's, to the world's treasury of knowledge in all of its spheres, including the aerospace, aerospace sphere which I am talking about today. Now, it's possible that among today's participants, there are some friends and some scientists and some colleagues with whom I had the honor of working for the good of Ukraine. These are people from Ukraine, from the, Ukrainian, from the American scientific laboratories and from the State Department of the United States. I greet absolutely everybody and thank you for showing up. Um, according to me, I now have to go to share screen. Ukrainian contributions to aerospace science and technology. Um, we already discussed who is providing this. So let me move slowly to the next level. Why are we talking about this? Why this topic? А то тому, over the years, I became greatly disappointed regarding the actual knowledge 
of Ukrainians about the positive aspects of Ukraine, their country, the ancestor country of many of us Ukrainians in the diaspora. Now, we know a lot about Ukraine's tragedies. For example, about the Holodomor. We're very familiar with that. But we know Ukraine mostly through its literature, through its folk music, its colorful folk dances, and of course, its fabulous food. However, I became convinced that we know very little about Ukraine's scientific and technical achievements. So that's why I became involved in this. Tell me, is this the image that you have about Ukraine? Czy to je image Ukrainy, jaki wy majete? The image of a bucolic, somewhat primitive, backward agricultural land. Tak jak było napisano, sadok wyśnewi bile chaty. Is it the image of a pair of oxen plowing a hilly field? Volina poli? Or is it the image of an older woman in a kerchief, the proverbial babusia, minding a couple of cows and some geese? Babcia na poli kotra pasa korovu i dvi. Tam huski. Cene je sjohodnišna Ukrajina. This is not today's Ukraine. Ta starsza żinka, jaka pasła korowy, siodnia ma jej smartphone. The older lady now is in a smartphone. The country is full of brilliant and ambitious young experts working at the very forefront of innovation frontiers, for example, in information technology or clean energy. It's amazing how many brilliant people there really are. So, so what? No push No, I believe it may be time for us to change the image of Ukraine that many of us hold so dear, the image that has been inculcated in us by our parents. Ja dumaj, šo čas nam zmeniti naš pohled, naš image Ukrajine. Ale pere tem, pamitajte še je profesor, please remember, I'm a professor, therefore I have to list facts, and then there is an examination. The first electronic computer in continental Europe was in Kyiv, was an institute of cybernetics. The first nuclear reaction in continental Europe was in Kharkiv, the Physical Technical Institute. Remember, I'm talking about strict hard science in this case, and uh, you know that's why I'm concentrating on that. One of the world's largest rocket design and manufacturing facilities, KB Piudenne, or KB Yuzhnoye, was one of one time, the Southern Rocket Design Bureau in Dnipropetrovsk, Dnipro, today in Ukraine. One of the world's largest space communication centers in Yevpatoria, in Crimea, in Ukraine. How about some other contributions to aerospace science and technology? Kilka prizvish veznechichnych Ukrainciu. Manu, kilka imen. A few names. Serhi Koroliu, Viktor Hlushko, Yuri Kondratyuk, Mikhailo Yankel, Johan Paton, Stefan Temoshenko, not Yulia, Stefan Temoshenko, Archep Yulka, William Jus, Ihor Sikorsky. Have you heard of these people? I bet you've heard of Sikorsky, but the other ones, you never know. Let me expand on these. Serhii Korolyu, he was the head of the Soviet space program, born in Zhetomir, just outside of Kyiv in Ukraine, responsible for Sputnik number one and the successors. Please remember, he is responsible for the first ever orbiting satellite of the Earth. We should be proud of that. He's the Ukrainian Werner von Braun. How about Viktor Hlushko? World-renowned cybernetics expert. First digital computer in continental Europe. 
Then we have Yuri Kontrachuk. By the way, that's his not name. He had to change his name because he was afraid of the KGB. He's a mathematician. No rockets, by the way, fly anywhere without using his trajectory calculations. He was the very first person to propose means of landing on the moon. Well, then we have Mikhailo Yangel. He's a rocket expert. He established the design bureau and factory in Dnipropetrovsk, Kabepyuvdenne. Then we have a famous name, Johan Paton, a world expert in welding. His inventions are used worldwide and in space. He invented the rapid welding technology for the Soviet T-34 tank that everybody was so afraid of, of World War II. Then we have Archebulka, much less heard of, much less known, super engineer, designer of superb motors from motor siege and for airplanes and helicopters. And then we come to my favorite, Stefan Temoshenko, a world renowned engineer, an expert in theory of strength of materials, expert of the theory of materialium. There's an absolutely excellent chance that if you are an engineer, most engineers in the world studied from his wonderfully clear and incisive book called Strength of Materials. Я знаю, що я вчився з тої книжки, і ніколи не забуду, що автор називався Стефан Тимошенко. And now something that we are rarely informed about. How about Steve Wozniak? Well, we all know Apple. Well, he is the American co-inventor of the microcomputer. Then we have somebody that is truly unknown. William, known as, born as Volodymyr Jus, an American engineer from Halichana, inventor of the Jus fastener, known as the quarter turn fastener. One quarter turn and it's locked. And it made aircraft assembly more efficient. He was a founder of the Ukrainian Institute of America. They have a wonderful building right opposite the um, um, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And then, of course, Ior Sikorsky. The Americans claim him as the American designer of many large seaplanes and of the first helicopter. Well, here we are in Dnipropetrovsk, and here's one of their products, two of their products. You have the Zenith 2 rocket being launched from a Pacific platform, and you have one of the Ukrainian satellites called Siege 2. It's obviously a pretty advanced nation to produce this. Now, by the way, it might be worthwhile to know that they produced in Ukraine, in Dnipropetrovsk, that feared intercontinental strategic ballistic missile called SS-18 with a beautiful warm name of Satan. Raketa nazvalsa Satana each with several individual targeted thermonuclear warheads. By the way, this rocket was mainly responsible for the SALT Treaty between the USSR and the USA. So I guess we should ask ourselves, can a country that has given the world such incredible technological achievements be considered a third world country? This is a country that has nurtured among, uh, has developed among many others, the talented Oleg Antono, as well as giving the world its first Earth satellite, as well as rocket landings on Venus. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, we shall concentrate on Ukraine's aviation and consider Ukraine's contribution to rocket science, space operation, at another time. Specifically, I have to narrow down a little bit here. We will look at the extraordinary prolific contributions by one of the world's premier aircraft designers. Tomusho me budem dvetsi na rakete i kosmos inchoho razu, tsem razom me skoncentrujemo se na na praci, na rozvitkah slavnoho dizajnera i takiv 
Oleha Antonova. Chumu Oleha Antonov? No. Zdetejstva, from early childhood, I have been an aviation and science fiction fanatic. My position as founding executive director of Science and Technology Center of Ukraine, STCU, gave me an extraordinary opportunity to work with top secret leading Ukrainian rocket and aviation scientists and engineers. To bolo po prosto nečuvana nahoda takomu jak ja, vechovani v taki formi jak ja, vtikačame vid sovietskoj režimu, mata nahodu strinuti tilko veznačnih naukovcev, znavcev, jakih je mal nahodu zustrečati v Ukrajini. For personal satisfaction and to provide economic support to these scientists in those times, nikto im ne plateo, ne bolo zarplata, ne bolo rivenja, ne bolo letrike, ne bolo ničo. I began my private collection of museum quality models of Ukrainian aircraft and rockets. Ja počal svoju kolekciju modelju tvorju aerokosmičnoj industriji Ukrajine i v tim pomagali mi nekotri moje znajome in spivpracivniki. Ca sama kolekcija Сьогодні знаходиться частиною Сталого фонду Королівського музею авіації Західної Канади у Вінніпезі. It is now part of the museum, the aviation museum in Winnipeg. Тут маєте Олега Константиновича Антонова. There he is. Олег Антонов, multifaceted talented, aircraft designer, engineer, who fathered such famous and beloved airplanes as the Cornhopper Bush plane AN-2, equivalent to our De ha Canadian de Havilland DCHC-3 author, and giant wide-body transports AN-22, Ante, the gigantic AN-124 Ruslan, and the supergiant Antonov-225 Maria. Now the question some of you may ask, or many can ask, can Che Oleg Antonov and Iho Tvore, Chich Morna Zarachovate Yak Ukrainskime? Can we count Oleg Antonov and his creations to, as Ukrainian? Sure, we can. Consider the Americans consider Sikorsky as being American, the Americans consider William Juice as American. Although Antonov was born in Russia, and was educated there. Every single one of his amazingly original family of aircraft stems from the time he established his bureau in Kyiv, in the capital of Ukraine. Please notice, Antonov spent his entire aircraft design life in Ukraine. Today, all Antonov aircraft are correctly considered as Ukrainian. So let's talk about him. From the beginning, he was a dreamer, a romantic dreamer, a Renaissance man who became fascinated by Louis Blériot's first flight across the English Channel. And he became skysick. I'm translating from, you, from, uh, from the Ukrainian language, Zachorovao Nebum. But he approached all of his dreams in a very fundamental and systematic manner a truly engineering approach. He always dreamed about flying. He spent most of his free time hanging on the fence of the military pilot airport until he became accepted as a regular. He founded the Amateurs Club, an aviation club. He began to seriously design and build models of gliders. And the first serious glider is the Oka-1 Pigeon, <coughs> Holub and uh, so on. But he was not accepted to Saratov University, so he ended up in the Hydro Aviation Department of Leningrad Polytechnic. He participated, developed gliders, he participated in contributions, um, and uh, he met uh, uh, the USSR's famous pilot called Chkalov, who fl flew one of the Antonov's drivers, uh, gliders, I mean, and then he actually met Serhii Korolyuk, the man in charge of the space industry. They were different people, but they remained close friends for their entire lives. 
at 25, he became chief of the glider factory in Moscow, where every USSR pilot had to start learning to fly in a glider. And he developed several gliders, a whole series of them. And by the way, when I opened my exhibition at the Museum of um, Aviation in Winnipeg, hanging on top of me was a blue, a, was a glider painted in the Ukrainian colors, blue and gold. This was absolutely a beautiful occasion. And he said, I build gliders so that we can fly. He also was a sportsman. He played tennis at a near professional level. He married his first wife, Lida Kochatkova, and took her on a honeymoon. You know, it's like buying your wife a, a vacuum cleaner for her birthday. He married his first wife and took her to a honeymoon glider to, to a glider contest in Cocktable. Interesting. Now, in, unpleasant things began to happen. Stalin zaboronil litate shiriakame i zakryl fabriku. Stalin forbade the sport of gliding and closed the glider plant. And you know why? Because one of the Soviet Union's top gliding instructors defected to the West using an Antonov glider. Wziął, poletił na zachód Antonovskom szeryaku i tu mu zakryli Antonovską fabrykę tych litakiów, tych szeryakiów. W każdym wypadku, Він тоді працював для Яковлева. He then got a job with the Yakovlev, an aircraft designer. And during the Second World War, he was responsible for designing a, a glider, a troop glider, which supplied uh, guerrilla partisan units with all kinds of equipment. As a result, he received the Medal of Partisan of the Great Patri Patriotic War. His, Extraordinary ab abilities were recognized at the end of World War II when he was offered the chance to establish his very own design bureau in Kyiv, in the capital of Ukraine. Jeho zdibnist, inženerska zdibnist, jeho tvorčist bola prezna s tem, še jemu dala nagodo stvoriti jeho vlastni bureau, jeho vlastni bureau у Києві, у столиці України. Подивимося тепер на головні, далеко не всі, але головні дизайни Олега Антонова і його бюро у Києві. Let's take a look at some of his major designs, by far not all of them. Now, we start with the favorite, cutest one. You have in front of you the silhouettes of the Antonov II. Take a look at it very carefully. Try to memorize the shape in its size, like the way it looks and the tail and so on. And please notice it has two wings, one on top, one below in all formations. Now, let's take a look. At the same time, in 1947, Tish to Davis was DHC Otter, the Havilland Company, at the Havilland in Canada designed the beaver and then the otter. Now, if you take a look at the shapes. Put the Porinite Vehlyad Antonova and Vehlyad Otter, Canadisco. Zverhu podibni, zboku duje podibni, speredu ne tak duje, bo se mai odnokrilo, se mai dva. Chumu. Why do we have a difference, one airplane to do the same job as the Canadian one? One has two wings, one has one wing. Well, it's like this. The Soviet approach to engineering was keep it simple, stupid. KISS, K-I-S-S, -S. keep it simple, stupid. If you can make it simple, if you can fix it with a hammer, that's the way we want to do it. So. The Canadians said, well, the Second World War is over, the 30s is over, we have to build a modern airplane, so we use a monocoque design with a single wing, and they designed a fantastic airplane, the de Havilland Otter. 
truly superb airplane. At the same time, Antonov said, well, wait a minute, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to create an airplane that can fly on ice, in, on gravel, on earth, on sand, in winter, in minus 40, plus 40. We need a simple airplane. Let's keep it simple. I don't care what it looks like, as long as it flies and it's safe and it's simple. So they went back to the 1930s and they designed a two-wing airplane. Let's compare the two airplanes. We're not gonna go through the whole detail, but here are the specifications of the Otter, the Canadian airplane right over here on the left, and the Antonov II. By the way, he had a lovely name, Kukuruznik. You know why? Because he could fly so low and so slow. Let's take a look. I I'm going to concentrate only on, on a few specifications. Let's take a look at the speed. The Canadian airplane, maximum airspeed, 160 miles per hour, 257 kilometers per hour. Guess what? The Antonov, 160 and 257. The same, exactly the same. Cruising. Canadian, 121 miles per hour. The Antonov, 120. But take a look at the next one. The stalling speed. Stalling speed is the minimum horizontal speed that an airplane can fly without falling. It's an indicator of safety. The Canadian airplane, the minimum stall speed is 93 kilometers per hour. The Antonov too, 50, one half. Can you imagine? This plane would simply hang in the air. Unbelievable safety. Um, Neymovirni litak. Tutti rizni vede to litaka. You can see all kinds of applications of these airplanes in various, very circumstances. Here on the right is a very interesting one on the bottom. If you look very carefully, you will notice it has a delta wing. All the other ones have regular wings, but this one has a delta wing. It's what's known in the Soviet Union as, as an ekrano plan. It would fly in ground effect, so it would support itself better. There are some more things in all kinds of agri an agricultural machine, transport machine up north in the ice and the cold of the Arctic. And uh, typical pictures of the of a passenger cabin of uh, another, so on. It's a, here's a stamp, Litake Ukraine, An Dva, and so on. The next one slide I think is most interesting. Look at that. Here is Antonov himself greeting the 100 millionth AN2 passenger. 100 millionth person is greeting her for flying in his Antonov airplane. And if that wasn't enough, what next? There he is, greeting the 250 millionth AN2 passenger. Can you imagine? This airplane flew over 250 million passengers. Ex absolutely amazing. So let's return to our topic. We're considering many of these airplanes, the AN-2 we just talked about, and then the series of AN-12, 24, 30, 22, 71, 125, and some post airplanes. The first one is eternal. Each one of the others was, and Maria, the last one here, is the largest airplane in the world at that time. And here are you have Antonov 2, 22, uh, and the uh, the N225 in the back. So let's take a look. All Antonov aircraft were known for their efficiency and effectiveness, their high economies with unbelievable strength reserve, and as a result, as a result great longevity. They could fly at very high altitudes and very high temperatures as well as flying in Arctic or subarctic conditions. Uh, 
він перші вклав до літаків композитні матеріали, монолітичну будову і пунктову зварювання, і таке ж і з зліплення частин літака клеєм. He was the first to introduce composite materials to aviation, monolithic construction, and glued structures in airplanes. He was at the app, you know, we talk about wide body aircraft, Boeing 747s and so on. Well, Antonov was the first to introduce the concept of the wide body aircraft, a concept copied by everybody today. We're passing through very quickly through a series of, of designs simply to compare. Here's the Antonov 212, which is a military transport built in large quantities, which is essentially the job that the American Lockheed Hercules has been designed to do. Both airplanes, unbelievably successful designs. Then came the ubiquitous everywhere. Anybody who has flown in Ukraine before, say, uh, uh, 2010 must have flown on an Antonov 24. They were everywhere. That, that simple, straightforward, very noisy turboprop airplane. I remember once flying from Ivano Frankivsk to Lviv, to Kyiv, and uh, there was no, uh, there was a problem with the fuel. So one of the rich oligarchs said, Don't worry about it, I'll pay for the fuel. I thought that was an interesting way to fly. Anyhow, the Antonov 30 airplane series, slightly bigger. And one thing you should notice, Prošu podivitsya, stil budove litaka, specialna tu speredu. In the Soviet Union, you never knew whether the airplane would not have to be used in a military environment. So, guess what? There was a bombardier position put right in front of the airplane. Then we move to the very famous Antonov 22. His name was Ante or Antius. This was the world's largest airplane in the 1970s. It was also the world's first wide body aircraft. Say, Perši Sheroko Fusalajni Litak Usviti. In Naibishi Litak Usviti, Uzali, Utech Chasak, Utech Chudev Sasimisatorhar, it's a name coming Jenshin. Moho modelu, eki te pariu muzeu aviaci. Cei te letak, it's the same airplane with different views of it. Um, uh, you will notice the bombardier position still in front, the inside, and so on. And next we go to one that's more familiar to us. Pidim tetko, shu me bishu uže znajemo pro njoho. The Antonovs 124 Ruslan. It's a very widely used, very heavy transport, and it is the world's largest airplane in the 1980s. Just take a look at, just take a look at this airplane. What a brilliant design. Now, this, this is the same airplane loading things, um, different views, different liveries, and so on. Now, let's go a little bit to the human aspect of Antonov. One of the most frightening, strange moments of Yehoshua Tiu and the difficult moments in his life were one of his airplanes had an accident. You can imagine, it's my airplane and it had an accident with all kinds of people dead. Bahatul yudei pohenolo uv odomu z moich litakiu. For example, when an Antonov 10 had an, uh, an accident near Kharkiv, Antonov commented to uh, the famous surgeon, there's a very famous Ukrainian surgeon that I should talk about somewhere else. His name was Amosov. He says, no, I will not build any large passenger aircraft anymore. I won't be able to handle the simultaneous death of that many people. He was a sensitive person. Whenever the phone would ring in the middle of the night, he would lift it. He would take the phone and listen. 
with a trembling hand because you never knew what the news were. Then we move to some unbelievably original designs. Take a look at this aircraft. It was designed to fly in remote, icy, gravelly, terrible conditions. <coughs> it is possible under certain conditions that stuff thrown away by the front wheel might fly into an engine. So guess what is the simple engineering solution that Oleg Antonov came up with? He says, things can fly into the engine? Well, let's put the engine in front of the thing that can flow, that can throw the stuff. So they mounted the engines in front of the, essentially right here in front of the wheel. So nothing can enter the engine. What a brilliant solution. So let's now we'll move to the finalist. The Antonov 225 Maria, the biggest airplane in the world. Just take a look at it. Count the number of wheels. Ano rachoyte kliko tam je kolis. Odan dva tre štere piaci sim raz dva tre štere piaci sim skor do hoboku. Isn't this extraordinary? Scripti čuseni je krasa u povitri. Prosto krasa ljudskoho tvoru u povitri. Je bi ve znali, jak javno veliki je. Ve bi mali moroz po škiri. You would get goosebumps, pimples, if you would realize the actual real size of this monstrosity in the air. I'll show you how big it is in just a minute. By the way, this is a picture of my model of the Antonov 225 Maria. It is also now part of the museum collection. I would like to zero in on this. You will note the, the original airplane. Let's go back to the uh, 224, to 124. You will notice it has two engines on each side and one tail, right? Okay. The Soviets needed a machine to carry the Soviet equivalent of the shuttle, which is called Buran. So Antonov submitted a design based on the Ruslan. However, if you see the Buran on top of the uh, airplane, you would notice that it sits right in the middle and it, it destroys the flow of air on the tail. So the engineering solution was to split the tail into two components, which would allow the steering. Because of the extra weight, they had to add an inner section to the wings of the Antonov 124, which made the wing so much longer on both sides. And as a result, they had to add two more engines, one here and one there. And they lengthened the fuselage. So the Antonov 225 is an outgrowth of the Antonov 124. So here is the Maria. Tutti Maria per advame spidnosenem nis spidneseni i hotovi here is a comparison of the Antonov 124 and of the Antonov 225. You will notice that the wing shape, if you start from the here, right here, if you take that wing, you can put it right here. The inside portion had to be added to make the wing longer. And you can see extra engines added because of the length of the wing and the single tail became double tails. 
Here's a comparison of the Antonov 225, the, the biggest passenger airplane in the world, the Antonov 3, the Airbus 380, and the Boeing 747. Just take a look. Here's the biggest Boeing 747 400. That's how it looks in shape. Here is the Airbus airplane, the 380. Now take a look at the Maria. How much bigger it is. It gathered many, many, many world records in terms of weight of transportation. 135 tons in one single piece was transported by this airplane. It's a Siemens company uh, product by Antonov. Here, here's the airplane itself. Here's the inside of the airplane, the engines, the shuttle or the Soviet Buran on top. By the way, the Buran right now is, uh, is too bad that it really sits in a, in a park somewhere in Moscow. Um, take a look at, this, at these wheels. One of the interesting things to keep in mind is that when that airplane lands and the wind is blowing sideways, they can swivel the, wheel, the wheels so that the wheels follow the runway while the airplane itself is crooked. Amazing. And one of the Antonov 124s landed in Winnipeg and I came to photograph it. And I was standing next to it, to near the front of it. And all of a sudden, I feel motion the whole airplane is falling down in front of me. I was, I thought maybe the, 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 the landing gear collapsed, but no, the landing gear simply moved forward and the entire airplane leaned in front of me. It, it is known as kneeling. What a beautiful solution to make the, 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 um, the uh, ramp to loading so much easier to operate. Here's the airplane, the 225 in flight. Tell me something, it's not an elegant machine. This huge monstrosity is flying. Why is it so big? Look, please think of it. Look at this airplane. Look at him. Podivits na cedi tak. A teper podivits na jeho prodevu veličinu. Take a look at this real size. Here is a, a Canadian football field, the green thing, the green background. The, I'm sorry, the American I'm a size football field. It goes from here to here. This is the Antonov 225 to exactly the same size, located on top of the football field. Can you imagine this thing in the air? Incredible. Next, I will have the honor, ja mam szczęście, że ja był przysutny, jak czego nie taka w pierwszy wyciągnęły I was present at the rollout ceremonies of this airplane in Kyiv, the Antonov 70. We have a problem in the military. You have the, um, say the, um, the, Hercules air, the Hercules aircraft that is all over the world. And we have the big airplanes, the galaxies and the Antonov 124s and so on. So you have the you have on one side the the Hercules, on the other side these monstrosities. But it turns out you need something in the middle. So the Ukrainians designed the Antonov seventy with a turboprop. Look at look look at this beautiful look at the beautiful propellers. They're counter rotating. They rotate in opposite directions, so the rear one catches the flow just right from the front one. That's good engineering, let me tell you, you know, to do that. So they designed an airplane to fit between the Hercules and the big ones. Now, it was to serve many air forces. Unfortunately, the Cold War was still in existence. Nobody trusted the Ukrainians. So the French company Airbus essentially copied this airplane and they built their own called the Air the um, uh, Airbus AN-400. Well, what can you do? That's the way life goes. 
the most recent airplanes are now, they're replacing the old airplanes in Ukraine with the Antonov 140, the replacement of the 24, and even more modern aircraft, the Antonov 148 and the regional passengers. I am sorry to say, Antonova. Okay, now about Oleg Antonov, the man. He was a human being after all. Vim se štiki bu ljudi na juni, Antonov. Vin bu maljar, vin ljubu maljuvate, device. Tud vin maljuji u sred prorode, jeho jeho kartine. Tud je jeho kartine. Vin ljubu šireki, vin hoće pokazati ih po vitri. He wanted to show. He was a pretty modern. He's obviously not a Rembrandt and not a Michelangelo. But still, he was pretty talented even in his field. And you'll see one of his comments later on at the very end, what he talks about. He was not an ordinary man. He was an engineer, he was an artist, he was a sportsman, he was a poet, he was a gardener. He had time and strength and did everything fully. He never did anything in a half ways. He was a true professional. To bolo pravdeva ljudina. He was known, he could be described as a renaissance person. Ljudina renaissance. He knew how to become a friend. He also knew how to love. Well, I guess he was an expert on that component. He's married for the third time uh, with Elvira Pavlivna, 31 years younger than he. 31 years. And they had two children, Olena and Andri. Well, I guess he had time and strength here. If we go back to the very beginning. Okay, somehow he was able to juggle the complex relationship between his three families. Anyway, 1979, Він мусив перейти дуже комплексну операцію на живіт щодо рак живота. У 82 року повернулася туберкульоза в його легені, але він пережив і одну, і другу. He survived both his return of the tuberculosis and the stomach cancer operation. But he was becoming psychologically troubled by certain complaints emanating from the presidium of the USSR that were that the airplanes were being reviewed at quotations at the highest levels. So unfortunately, on the 4th of April, 1984, the unequaled Ukrainian aircraft designer Oleg Antonov passed away. Oleg Antonov, na žal, pomer 4. kvitnia 1984 roku. Kto vin bu? Jeho dosiahnenia. Some of his achievements and awards. Founder of, one of the founders of World Gliding. Member, Academy of Sciences of Ukraine and of the USSR. Please notice. He was a member of the Academy of Science of the USSR and of Ukraine. Doctor of Technical Sciences, professor, head of the Department of Airplane Construction at the Kharkiv Aviation Institute. By the way, I was asked in Canada, what is this Kharkiv Aviation Institute? And I had to tell him that this was the premier aviation institute in the Soviet Union. He was an honored scientist of the Ukrainian SSR. He's the laureate of the state awards of the USSR and the, the Ukrainian SSR. He, was the, he received the Lenin Award. He was a hero of the socialist labor. He was the recipient of the USSR highest awards, I already said, so the Order of Lenin. Fatherland Medal degree, Worker and Red Banner medals, Tupolev Gold Medal, that's an aviation medal. His name was given to his KU factory and to the Kiev Aero Club. He is father of the Antonov II, the white body, 822, 70, 124, and Maria. 
and he wrote a book called 10 times from the beginning. In other words, if you're not right the first time, go back and do it again until you do it right. Vertajte, popróbuj še raz, až poki narešče ne bude tak, jak maj buti. Should you ever have the luck, je bi veko li smali na hodu, puti v Kijevi and visit the Ukraine's beautiful capital, Kijev. Take a moment and visit the resting place of this extraordinary contributor to world's aviation. Pidjit podivit se na bajkove kladovešče, na pametnek cej nezvičajni ljudine. This is his grave marker. Pametnek na hrobi Oleha Antonova, bajkove kladovešče Kijev, bajkove cemetery Kijev. Generalni aviakonstruktor Oleh Konstantinovič Antonov. From the Antonov II Kukuruznik to the world's largest aircraft, Antonov 225 Mria. That's his entire family of flying machines. That's one person responsible for design for all of these machines. That's an amazing achievement. His legacy, prehadaimo, should se vse zavdjake od njej nezvečajne ljudene. Let's remember that all of this is due to the efforts of a special human being. Well, allow me to brag a little bit. Dozvolite meni trochi pohvaliti se pro dekotri reči, kotri ja zrobil v tjomu napremku. Here are some of the of my collections of models of Ukrainian aircraft, rockets and satellites which have been donated to the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. This is my a photograph of the Mria model that I have. Just for you to know, its wingspan as a model is about two meters. So it's not a tiny device. Here are some of these models on my porch. And they are now at the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. Part of my collection this, by the way, this was a poster advertising the, ex the exposition, which lasted two years. And by the way, six, over 60,000 people came to see the show. That's unbelievable for something dealing with Ukraine. So here you have a Zenith 2 rocket. By the way, all of this stuff was built by the museum. All I did is I supplied the rocket, which was given to me by Kabepiu then in Dnipropetrovsk. The poor guy who carried this rocket, his name was Boyko. Jak vin nis tu raketu, vona bola taka tjaška, šo vin bo zihnjeni prosto horizontalno, šo bi imeni prinesti. It was an incredibly heavy device. Can you imagine me bringing this rocket into Canada? At Pearson, Toronto Airport, at the customs, na metnici v Toronti. Excuse me, sir. Is there anything that you wish to declare? <laughs> no, no, nothing, just a rocket. What do you think the reaction would be? I kaj vedo imate reakcija bola metnici, ki ja kazal, še ja maju raketu, jako jo hotil bi deklarovati. No, to bolo smišno. Tudi ukrajinski suputnik Sich Oden, Ukrainian satellite Sich 1, some of the displays. This is in another display. And here you have a picture of the Antonov Mria. By the way, from this side to this side is about uh, six meters long. Tak so to ide tak, jak ktoś na njo odivelsia, vin poprosto preholomšoval, vin taki veličazni bu. I tu je jedan z tih veličaznih posters na naši. This is one of the big posters in the show. Antonov and AN2. And here's what I'm saying from Antonov. We can only advance and develop new ideas through some kind of a revolutionary process. Značit, nemožljivo prodolžovati to same, robljače te same. Musica imate hoč jakis, nazvim to, revolucijno dumku, še bi iti vpred. 
I'm extremely proud. So I'm extremely proud that this, my unique and important collection of Ukraine aerospace contributions is now part of the permanent fund of the Royal Aviation Museum of Canada. Я і дуже гордий з того, що ця моя величава колекція українських аерокосмічних творів тепер є частиною сталого фонду Королівського музею авіації в Західній Канаді. Дивіться, що він сказав. I love the statement because one of my professors at McGill University told me, you are going to be an engineer. If it doesn't look right, it's wrong. There's something wrong with it. And here's Oleg Antonov. Aviation reveals the relationship between engineering perfection and beauty. Notice he added the word beauty, an element of art, which leads me to another statement of Antonov's. If not for designing aircraft, I would have become a painter. Nice, isn't it? You know, я думаю, що ми повинні пишатися тим досягненням України в аерокосмічній науці та технології. Я далеко не покрив всілякі інші речі. Ми тут сконцентрувалися лише на Антонові. We can be very proud of Ukrainian achievements in the aerospace science and technology. What I talked about today nowhere near covers the wide field, anything from metallurgy to chemistry to uh, surgery, you name it, it's there, okay? But this is for us to keep in mind, we should be proud of it. May I quote a comment made by a visitor to a, an exhibition I had in Edmonton? I would like to цитувати, що написав один український хлібороб фермер He wrote the following. Dear professor, thank you. I am finally proud to be Ukrainian. 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 I wanted to achieve that with my show. So this is the end. I really, really thank you for participating with such patience. Дякую вам за вашу терпеливість та за вашу увагу. І бажаю всім всього доброго. Дякую. Дуже дякую, пане професоре. Чи якщо є якісь запитання, будь ласка, прошу уживати Q&A по можливості. А як ні, то піднести руку там, де є там, де реакціонс. Я постараюся передати питання. Місце Сі, я б хотів е, запитатися, передусім подякувати професорові Агамлешті за таку е, будуючу доповідь за інформацію, яку він дуже гарно, детально нам подав. І може я дозволю собі запитатися вас, пане колего, і у зв'язку з вашою е, так важливою ролею в е, в розбудові українських талантів в Україні, перенесення їх в сферу не мілітарну, а, може, більш благородну. Чи ви знаєте, що з якими з тих людей сталося, чи ви з ними є в контакті, 22-2 тисячі, чи... Це 20 тисяч, це дуже велике число. Будь ласка, можете відповісти, як інші пишуть, пишуть питання тепер. Ну, добре. А, ви мене чуєте? Так. Я... Okay. А, питання дуже цікаве. Як ми прийшли, як я почав ту організацію УНТЦ у Києві, абсолютно всі українські науковці, 
з якими я повинен мати до діла тоді, вони всі були засекречені за совєтського часу. Вони всі були переконані, що я працював для CIA в Америці. Себто для розвідки, американської розвідки. Навіть моя мама була переконана, що я працював для Служби безпеки Америки. Розумієте, дуже тяжко було е, переконати їх, що ми не є на те, щоб красти їхню технологію. Ми, на те, ми були створені на те, щоб їм допомогти залишитися і далі працювати у своїй ділянці, у своїй експертизі, але по можливості в Україні. Нема двох слів, що ззаду, що ми хотіли, ми хотіли затримати науковців українців в Україні. Ми не хотіли їх бачити в Китаю, ми не хотіли бачити їх в Ірані, в Іраку, у Лібії. Розумієте, того нам не було потрібно. Але головне було Україна. Треба також зрозуміти, що Україна є незалежною державою, демократично незалежною державою. Значить, кожна людина має право робити те, що їй виглядає бути кращим. Значить, декотрі науковці рішили шукати щось іншого у світі. The grass is greener somewhere else. You know, they, Ukraine, the Ukrainian scientists essentially had a free choice of moving wherever they want, but we wanted to keep them in Ukraine, to keep them working for the Ukrainian state. So as a result, we encouraged not only the support of scientific work based on their previous weapons know-how, Like if you are building something to shoot down rockets, maybe you can apply it and create a new refrigerator. Who knows? I'm inventing things. Okay. But we try to have them apply their intellectual development in an industrial way by have them deal with European, Canadian and American industries to join them so they can develop this for the good of everybody. In addition, in Ukraine, a good number of these scientists, particularly the younger ones, branched out and they started developing their own firms, their own consulting firms, their own manufacturing firms. And that's how the whole thing were developed. So I think we did a good job I don't think we did a perfect job, but I tell you what, I have to put this in, uh, Pane Professor. I want to thank the State Department of the United States of America. I want to th thank the American scientists that came to help us. And in particular, I want to thank each and every one of the Ukrainian co-workers that trusted me and worked with me in Ukraine for the good of Ukraine. Okay. Panie profesorze, ja daję jakieś zapytania. W pierwszej mierze, panie profesor Jarewicz, Darewicz, bądź łaska, zapytajcie, jak się możecie teraz zgłosić się. Coś nie może. Czuję. Może. Może wyśmienno można mi powiedzieć. No nic, ja nie znaję pytania. Ja inne pytania. Czy Antonow sobie poczuwał Ukraińcem i czy miał polityczne poglądy? A, to jest bardzo ciekawe, bardzo ciekawe pytanie. Ja думаю, że Antonow, ja go osobiście, na żal, nie mam na godę poznać. Але з того, що я бачив, з того його поведінки, і з того, що він писав, і з тих речей, що він робив, я би приписав йому е, якість аполітичну, себто не політичну людину. Я думаю, що він he was knowledgeable. Obviously, he knew he was born in Russia. However, he lived his entire Uh, productive life essentially in Ukraine and he became um, 
a citizen of Ukraine, how he felt deep inside, it's pretty hard for me to really tell. Um, unfortunately, at the time, even at the time when I was there, the language of communication that was used at Antonov and at Kabepiudenne and at many other establishments in Ukraine was, in fact, Russian, because that was the communications language instituted by the Soviet Union. It is not easy to resuscitate the national language. So I, I don't have a really good answer for you. Thank you. Dr. Darevich, do you want to ask your question? I don't hear you. How did Antonov compensate for the weight shift by moving the engines forward in the plane that you mentioned? Hmm. Well, if you take a look at the uh, uh, Antonov 71 to 73 series, uh, there are several things that happened. First of all, the engines themselves were moved forward. They're sticking out in front of the wings quite a bit. Now, if you, if you take a look at modern engines today, a good portion of the engine is actually ahead of the wing as well, but it's usually quite a distance behind the front wheel. So what he did, he positioned the engines much more forward on top of the wing, just, just at the front wheel or a tiny little bit behind. He extended the fuselage a little bit backward to create a longer lever, uh, I guess a, le a leverage on, on, on the wing. If you can imagine the tail plane and the wing being the, uh, the in-between position and the engines here. So it tried, it tried to op uh, operate this way. So basically it was a calculated uh, weight times distance, force times distance to match. That's the way they did it. That's my answer. Thank you. I see that Dr. Darya a question. Я маю наступне питання до Остапа, я його називаю Остапом, бо ми старі колеги з Пласту, з Далма-Далма. Як та фірма Антонова, як та фірма Антонова собі дає раду тепер? Чи вони виробляють багато літаків, чи мають якісь нові проєкти? Юрко, дякую, що ти присутній, що, ти, що ми ще у нашому віці маємо нагоду поговорити. Антонов фірма перейшла кілька стадій. Вона була окремим. Система у Радянському Союзі функціонувала в такій формі. There was a design bureau that created designs. The design bureau might have a small factory next to it to create uh, the first models, the test models. Once that was proven and uh, okay was received from the authorities, that design in its entirety was moved to some factory which could be anywhere in the Soviet Union, in Kharkiv, in the Ural, Ural Mountains or whatever. Так що так була стара історія. Як розлетівся Совєтський Союз, залишилася лише київська фабрика і в Харкові. Тоді Антонов старався продукувати ті літаки, що він міг. Ан-70 was a joint project. Ан-70 was a joint project between Ukraine and Russia and the Soviet, for Soviet Union and Russia. Unfortunately, the political situation between Ukraine and Russia led to the fact that this project did not go through as a joint project. So then Antonov went through a series of transformations 
from a to, from a state to an independent company, and then it was recently reabsorbed into an overall defense network of Ukraine. As far as the airplanes that it's how it, whether it's producing, it is producing some airplanes, but not many. It has sent its designs, it has sold some of its designs, like the Antonov 148 was sold to Iran to build as a local transport in Iran. China, most recently, has been trying very, very hard to buy the expertise and the um, designs of two major items. One, the Zaporizhia Sich motor factory and the Antonov 225 Mria to be constructed in China. Wow. Uh, it's, that was a pretty dangerous situation. I don't think the, Ameri the United States of America is terribly impressed by this idea. So uh, essentially Antonov, I would say does, I would not say exists, but I would say it subsists at the moment. Dziękuję. Um, dziękuję, profesor. Tut jeszcze odno pytanie duże podobne. Jaki jest sta stan cech litakiego siłodni i czy je rynok nawet podczas pandemii? O, to rynok je. Czemu nie? Trans trzeba, trzeba raczej przewozić. Na przykład nawet Mrija i Ruslan je majże Celý čas v Rusi i nosit si nějaké vantáži, masky, jakýsi tam personal protective devices z rýžných krajín do rýžných krajín. Nemá v světě lítaky, jaký mohli by prevesti ta, co ty lítaky mohli prevesti. Objednaný náci je vžívají. Kanadijská armia vžívala Antonov 124, šo by prevozili výzkový materiál do Afganistánu. Ви уявіть собі, канадська держава мусила наймати українські літаки Антонов-124, щоб вести свої речі до Афганістану. Так що є потреба. І проблема не лише, there's a need, there's a market for these airplanes. You have to understand that the Antonov-124 is a 1980s design. It was the largest airplane in the 1980s. We're now talking about 40 years. These airplanes are reaching the end of their design lifespans. So they have to be upgraded and they have to be modernized. Unfortunately, in today's state, the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian, uh, well, the Ukrainian government simply does not have the wherewithal or the economic resources to be able to uh, finance such development. So they're looking for international investors in this business. Duże dziękuję. Jeszcze Hello, jeszcze pytania. Op, nie, coś tu mini. Aha. What design projects is Antonov working on now? Antonov is working on very updated modern um uh, 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 regional transport, let's call them a regional transport aircraft. If you wish, the latest approach to regional transport to replace the Antonov 24, which has been replaced by the 148 in any case. But we're looking at modern, uh, really modern right. designs. That's what Antonov is doing right now. I don't think Antonov, Antonov is not designing, as far as I know, and remember, I am out of the picture. I am here in, in, in Winnipeg, in Canada. I'm not involved on a daily basis with all these people. So I don't know really what exactly is going on in there. But for, to the best of my knowledge, Antonov right now is concentrating its efforts on the design of affordable, effective, low cost, highly efficient, regional transport airplanes airplanes there's also a follow-up question from the same person russia always had a poor engine design capability 
Is Ukraine engine and rocket engine know-how at risk of being stolen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, there were several, uh, we can point out a whole bunch of things. In the disputed region where the war is going on in, in Donbass, there were factories that produced all kinds of components for helicopters, engines, and so on. Those factories have been dismantled and moved entirely to Russia. They have been, Russia has been trying to steal or acquire, to be nice about it, the technological know-how of Motor Sich. That's a very, very important factory that designed and built most of the motors of the big airplanes used in the Soviet Union and helicopters. That is why the Chinese are very interested. And that is exactly why right now the United States is doing its, 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 its utmost in, in, well, in interfering with the possible sale of this knowledge and capability to China. So uh, you hit on a very important thing. It, it might be worthwhile to point out that Ukraine with about 50 million inhabitants was essentially one less than a quarter of the Soviet Union in terms of population. But in terms of scientific know-how, it contributed very close to 50% of the entire scientific potential of the Soviet Union and engineering potential. So therefore, it's a gold mine for somebody who wants to acquire knowledge. Dziękuję. Jeszcze dwa pytania na żywi. Somebody is sending a picture of the Institute, uh, American Institute, Ukrainian American Institute, but I don't, I don't have it. I need. Pani Ireneo? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hala Hanas. Um, I'm wondering, did any of Antonov's children follow in his footsteps? Hmm. This is a very simple answer for me. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No idea. Не знаю, що не абсолютно не маю відповіді на то, не знаю. Пане Іринею, ви там проведьте тим. Хтось втік, тут був, а тепер перестав. Вже, а може зараз, зараз, зараз. Ask to unmute. Може буде, може нема. Може буде, може нема. Я не знаю зараз секундочку. Прошу дуже. There is a comment uh, in the chat. Several comments. Зараз, де ж ми тут? Please talk. Wonderful presentation. Дякую потім. Uh, Cues more historical than technical questions is more more historical than technical. Please expand, if possible, on the space race between Werner von Braun for NASA and Serhii Koroliu, actually born in Ukraine, and as I have been told, the only non-Russian buried in the Kremlin for the Soviet Space Agency. You mean I'm supposed to uh, uh, expand? That's what uh, the request is. That's a very, very long uh, expansion. <laughs> you know, I specifically said at the beginning that I'm concentrating on aviation and I'm bypassing the, um, uh, the, 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 the rockets and space component. However, without any doubt, there was a big race going on between the Americans and the Soviets. 
And there was a lot of problem on both sides. The Americans, a lot of failures of rockets that were trying to do this. And uh, Nikita Khrushchev basically said, listen, we have to catch them and pass them. So Serhii Korolyov, the Ukrainian designer, the head of the Soviet space industry uh, or uh, the system, which was essentially an equivalent position to the German designer that the Americans appropriated, Vernon from Brown, he submitted a design built on, on a rocket called an R7 rocket. And the Soviet approach to things, as remember, remember what I said before, keep it simple, stupid. Now, obviously, I am simplifying to the very end here. I don't think it's fair even to use that simplification. But in fluid mechanics, when you teach fluid mechanics, you always use the picture of a circle and airflow that comes to the circle and goes around it and so on and so on. And we can calculate this. We have the mathematics to handle that. Now, if you imagine and you take the circle and you squeeze it, you get an elongated shape. And if you squeeze the end a little bit more, you get a pointed shape. So essentially you get a shape of a wing and we can then transform the mathematics to calculate the airflow on that wing. So what I'm trying to say is that we are very good at calculating what happens on a circle or what happens on a sphere. So the Soviet system very simply said, hey, we haven't got a clue what's going on, but we know about the sphere. So you know what? We're gonna build a big ball. So they built a big ball in Ukraine, by the way. So the big ball, they put a radio system inside, they put four antennas at the end, put the whole thing on a rocket on top and they shut it up in the air. And guess what? It went around the earth and it went beep, 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 beep. And the first human orbiting satellite had arrived. And the Americans were scared out of their wits because they couldn't figure out how did such a, how did, how did it go up there? It must have been a gigantic rocket. Well, it's true. The Americans were designing super special designs rocket. They were tailored to the job. The Soviets didn't know how to build a big bomb. So they said, well, if we can't build a, a small bomb, if we can't build a smaller bomb, and we have the big bombs, I guess we have to build a big rocket. So they built a gigantic rocket and that's what they had. So in the end result, you had a very practical down to earth approach from the Soviet Union, Ukraine or Russia, whichever way you want to talk about. By the way, the next step, Vostok and Laika, the little dog, and then finally Gagarin, Gagarin was put in a bigger ball. They shoved him inside and he was there as a passenger. He had no way of controlling the thing at all. Up, around, and he came down. Okay? The Americans uh, used a different approach. They tried to design something with an ablative surface, self-stabilizing, and God knows what else. And in the end result, the Americans ended up with a better machine. And they threw all the resources into the, into the game, and they beat everybody, and they landed on the moon with Apollo 7, 11. So there we are as a roundabout answer. Okay, thank you. There's uh, another couple of questions I'm trying to balance between the chat and the Q&A. Uh, Ukraine had over 1,500 research institutes during Soviet times. What is the current state of affairs? The situation with the institutes in Ukraine was totally abnormal. When you're dealing with a mentality which was Soviet, immediate, remember this, I, I'm, I'm, when I was there, it was 94 to 98, last century. That was a long time ago. Soviet mentality permeated everything. And therefore, everything was an institute. Everything was a university. 
um, and everything, if there was a special institute of something all over the place, huge numbers of, of scientists, any normal uh, country, any normal state is simply economically impossible. It's not possible to maintain such a gigantic scientific structure that Ukraine had at the time. It needed very bad rationalization. They're doing it very slowly. The Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences under the previous leadership of Mr. Paton and now it has a new president um, is trying very hard to rationalize all these institutes into something more um, uh, together. For example, some institutes are being absorbed into universities. Some universities are being collapsed. Um, that's the situation that's going on today. Um, if you have limited resources, which is what Ukraine has at the moment, and you have a large number of places where you can put the resources, you end up putting very little into many places, which is not good in order to concentrate your efforts into areas that you excel at. You really have to choose the area. And I think Ukraine right now, besides fighting an absolutely useless war with Russia, is trying very hard to rationalize its scientific and research and engineering establishment that it inherited from the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, still carries on in large measure today. Thank you. Another comment here. Thank you very much for an informative and interesting presentation, followed by a question. Interesting that Oleg Antonov connected more with Ukraine instead of Russia after World War II, set up KU and Kharkiv factories and even buried in Ukraine rather than Russia. And say not in the, and why not in the Kremlin, given his achievements? Do you have any answers? Why? No, I don't have any answers. But remember, from 1946 to 1984, Oleg Antonov lived, breathed, had families, designed, and thought in Ukraine. Without any doubt, he was influenced by this part of the Soviet Union, the other country, Ukraine. Um, why he was not recognized to such a degree uh, by the Kremlin, by being uh, interned in, 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 in Moscow? Well, mainly, be, I, I, I'm trying to find an answer. Russia had several other major designers, Yakovlev, Tupolev, Mikoyan Gurevich, MiG of MiG fame, and so on. These are famous engineering designers, aircraft designers, and they essentially have been recognized or handled by Russia the way they think is appropriate. In Ukraine, the most modern and the biggest name that was that we had was Antonov's and of course uh, Lulka from Motor Sich. So that's probably the reason why they were left in Ukraine. Uh, may I point out something to you? There was a little side story. My wife and I were on a yacht belonging to Kabepiv then at the Rocket Design Bureau, and we were sailing on the Dnipro River of Dnipropetrovsk. And we're lying on the deck, and one of the um, uh, leaders of, of, of the Rocket Bureau, I'm not exactly, I don't remember whether he was the legal department or the financial department. But anyway, I will paraphrase his discussion with me. He says, Pane Professor, vi znajte, što ja je Moskal. Mr. Professor, you know, I am, I'm Russian. So I say, well, so what? Nuscho. And he looks at me, remember, we're lying on the deck. And he looks at me, he says, you know, I have been in this country for over 30 years. This 
is my country. And I'm quoting it. Se ye moya derjava. And we're going to try and do the best we know how to dig ourselves out of the hole that we are in. I may be able to do what I do, but it's all possible. To be able to find the hole in which we are in. Maybe that is the reason why Antonov is in Ukraine. Okay. Hello. Can't hear. Okay. Sorry, another comment. Ukrainian Institute of America, truly beautiful mansion from late 1890s, near the Metropolitan Museum of Art, not uh, modern uh, art. Well worth visiting. Not only founded, but also purchased for the institute by Volodymyr Jus, followed by Duje Dyakuyu. Now, was Antonov aware of Howard Hughes and his desire to build the world's largest aircraft? What would be his advice to Howard to be more successful in his attempts? To Howard Hughes? That's what it says. What would, it, what would his advice be to be more successful in that respect? Well... You know, that's very interesting. Howard Hughes was one of these incredibly rich dreamers. He was a, a, a pilot. He liked danger. He liked living on the edge. His plane was built of wood. So right off the right, right, right from that start. It could not be a successful airplane. Now, certain components for certain purposes can be made of wood. For example, the Mosquito in, in, in Britain, the Second World War was built of wood because there wasn't enough aluminum. However, to be a truly successful aircraft, you have to address the needs of an eventual customer. And there were no customers at that time for the mon for the enormous leap forward that Howard Hughes dreamed and created. That is an achievement. But unfortunately, as a result, that achievement now sits in a museum, I believe in San Diego or someplace or in California. Um, so I, if my advice would be Design something that somebody actually needs. And without any doubt, the Antonov 124 was needed by the military. The Antonov 22 was needed by the military. The Antonov 12 was needed by the military, by the civilian. And the Antonov 225 was the only one that was capable of carrying the Soviet Buran. In other words, there was a customer. That's my, that would be my advice to uh, Mr. Hughes, whom I admire greatly. Okay, there's two questions here which are quite short and probably can be answered quite quickly. Could Antonov be considered the competitor to Bombardier? It's the first one. Only in the most modern airplanes, the new ones. The, 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 the regional aircraft which, which are being designed right now um, uh, would be um, uh, a competitor to Bombardier. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I say, the Canadian government and um, uh, the Canadians basically they sold the aircraft to Airbus, to France, which I think is a very sad commentary on what uh, we in Canada are able to produce but we are unable to sustain financially. Okay. Ha yeah. Have you ever seen up close an Antonov land in Canada or Winnipeg? Yes. I have seen it land in, at the Winnipeg International Airport. In fact, it usually parks uh, right across the fence from the old uh, Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. 
uh, which is a sight to behold, let me tell you. By the way, there's a brand new museum being built uh, very close to the new Winnipeg uh, air terminal. And I've been informed that they will include my, my collection uh, as somewhere in, in that museum. Great. So I saw the plane land. I also, uh, when I first saw it, it usually comes in about every three months to Winnipeg to transport big agricultural machinery somewhere in the world. Uh, I saw it uh, from the airport and I, I went and I went and I called in the RCMP because you need permission. And I asked whether I could possibly photograph the airplane from close. So they looked at me as if, as if I was a terrorist and they called the Antonov people and they agreed and they told me to show up the next morning at five o'clock in the morning. So I showed up with my telephoto lens and my wide angle lens and with the crew drew uh, in, in a van, we drove up to the Antonov and I was simply blown up. I was blown out by the sheer size of this enormous, enormous machine, you know, and I won't go into the details. I photographed everything I could. And I and then the passenger, the, the pilot actually came down. He shook my hand. He thanked me for all the work I was doing for the Ukrainian aviation. And he invited me upstairs to visit the pilot's cabin. And we had to go up on a teensy little ladder, which was at most a foot wide. And when you walked up like three stories, the ladder shook up and down like this. It was terrible, but we managed. I managed to survive the. So I did see the airplane land. Yes. Okay. Another comment here, Ostap. As always, your presentations are totally engrossing, and at the same time, highly entertaining. You are a true ambassador and promoter for the engineering profession. Well done, and thank you for your invitation to your presentation, from your friend Roman Zakaluzhny in Calgary. Now. Uh, there, there, there's another question here from Mr. Dershko. Would you like to ask it in person, please? Um, the breathing, Pane Ostapi, Pane Professor. Radi Puchuti was Holos. Che vis naiti chino kreni chef chat methodiku altshulera vinbu patent agent no kreni yaki vena show system invention algorithms yaku se chas design and gifted programs. I wish you the very best of health. As far as an answer to your question about the Altshuler's algorithms, unfortunately, it is beyond my realm of knowledge, and I have no answer for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I думаю, we should be dishing to Kincha. I don't have any more questions or commentary. Yeah, ma. Ah, to tam she. Možná. Thank you ešte raz. Dúžim sa dečno vám ustape prekrásnu dopovid. I ja chcel. Stochačam zapovijte, što za dva tjedni budemo imati dopovid s inšo, s inšo sfere, s vsim z inšo sfere, od sa doktora Ihora Kutaša na tem časavo temu razdumovanja nad ostanjimi podijami stosovno pravoslavja v Ukrajini. Odže, prošu svetkovati za ohološenjami, da diju vse, što mi možemo vse zrealizovati. Duži ďakuj še raz in bažaju vsim parnoho dnja in novoho miseca. Ta vse dobro. Ďakuj duže za te, što vi sluhali, a mojim druzjam, tovaršam, znajomem, які мали терпеливість і котрі попросту, ну, мали терпеливість це послухати, я вам, я дуже-дуже вам вдячний. Бажаю всім здоров'я і щастя у цей поганий період вірусу. Дуже дякую. До побачення всім.